it is our pleasure to welcome today for this uh, fifth plenary talk of the of the of the Congress, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Julia Batcher, who is um, she's uh, with um, with NASA at the Johnson Space Center in uh, in Houston. Uh, she was um, she's uh, she did her her uh, bachelor at uh, Purdue University in mechanical engineering, then. Uh, the master's and PhD at the uh, California Institute of Technology in uh, focusing on controlled robotic and dynamical system and uh, had a minor in planetary science. So that's basically, I guess she has been interested in space exploration since, <laughs> since a long time ago. And she's uh, since um, 2002 working with, with NASA and uh, she will talk to us about, um, so she's now the, Autonomy and Vehicle Systems Manager at uh, the Gateway Program at NASA Johnson Space Centers, uh, uh, Center. And she also serves as Autonomous Systems Technical Discipline Lead for, for the Johnson Space Center and is responsible for the research and development of autonomous system capabilities on the Earth, the International Space Station, the Gateway. And uh, she will talk to us about what she's been doing for uh, autonomous space spacecraft control and caretaking and these human robot interfaces so i welcome julia who accepted very gladly to give this plenary talk and i i, I think the the presentation will be of interest to many of you and uh, i hope you enjoy the, the presentation to so julia uh, the floor is is yours so if you want to to share your screen Yes, thank you. Here, let me get everything situated really quickly. All right, can you see my slides? Okay, we can see your slide perfectly. Excellent, thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk a little bit about autonomous control and the future of human spaceflight. I'm at Johnson Space Center at um, our, our center, so there's like 11 NASA centers, but ours is really responsible for humans in space. We're at the home of the astronauts. We do all the astronaut training. We have mission control, um, and we are typically the ones involved in any of the things that have to do with, with our humans um, as we go forward. And so autonomous control, obviously, we usually think about that as being outside of humans. Um, this uh, presentation, hopefully I can convince you all that uh, there's a very tight bond between the future of our humans in space and being able to use autonomous control. So the first picture I'm going to show you, um, this is the International Space Station. Um, it's been in orbit around the Earth, low Earth orbit for many years, more than 20 years, um, and been continuously manned um, since the very first time that we put people on it, um, I think in 2001 or so. So it's been a long time that um, we've had this, this laboratory in space. It's interesting in that it, um, has been continuously crewed, like I said, and it has um, a whole slew of people on the ground. Um, our mission control center, as you see down in the bottom corner there, um, that spend their time 24 seven, making sure that the ISS does what it needs to do. It's this set of people send up around um, 700 commands per day to keep the ISS flying and, and the folks on board, our astronauts, cosmonauts and um, astronauts from other countries are all doing uh, similar things. And in addition to their science loads and protecting their own health, um, they spend a, a decent amount of time doing maintenance and caring for, for the lab that we have there. It's an engineering marvel, it's very cool. Um, and you know, it's it's been uh, return on investment has been huge on this, of course. But as we move further out into space exploration of our solar system, we really need to think a little bit differently about how we're going to do things. So this is an artist rendition of, of the project that I'm on right now. Um, the Gateway is part of the Artemis program. The Artemis program is meant to send people back to the moon's surface sustainably to ensure that we can now think more about going further beyond our 
Earth moon system to think Mars. And Gateway is meant to be essentially a space station around the moon that is the gateway both to the moon's surface as well as Martian exploration in our in our future. It's meant for humans but it's going to be operated quite differently than the ISS. Uh, Gateway will only be crewed about one month out of the year, so it'll spend most of its life around the moon in an uncrewed state. We also will be flying between three and four other vehicles when Gateway is flying, and so the concept of a mission control center that's 24-7, always staffed and taking care of this um, space station that most of the time isn't supporting human life is not going to work. So we really had to think very deeply about how do we break the paradigm of this, you know, Earth-driven control. Another reason that it's really important to do is because we really are thinking about beyond. So what is autonomy? I'll use that word a lot. I'm sure you all use that word a lot, which you all do. Um, so I'm going to define it for, for this presentation just so that, that we're all on the same page. But we define it here as the ability to separate a spacecraft and its crew, if a crew's on board, from earthbound control and oversight. We may have crew on board taking care of the vehicle itself, but that is part of the, the system being autonomous. We've actually taken some notes from the, the U.S. Department of Defense, who in the 90s came up with this concept called the, the OODA loop. Um, it was meant to describe in fairly simple terms how a squadron of soldiers would be able to take care of themselves out on a mission without any connection back to a centralized con command or control. Um, and what they do is, is the following. They have kind of observe and orient, and what we consider that to be is the state analysis, understanding what our system is doing from a fault perspective it concludes it includes fault detection and then isolation or locating where that fault might be the second half of it is deciding and then acting so you can plan and then execute essentially what you're going to do um, on your system from a fault standpoint this includes the recovery um, section so autonomous control really is needed to allow our system to operate this independently, to separate it from the earthbound control. So why autonomy? We've already talked about that a little bit, but from a spacecraft standpoint, the reason that there are so many people on the ground dealing with the ISS is that it was built up over time across um, fairly, fair, many different um, countries and companies contributing different parts and pieces to the ISS. Assembly wasn't even complete until probably a decade after it flew. And so it took a long time to get to the state that it is now. Gateway is going to be the same sort of thing. It's going to be have international cooperation and contributions. In fact, the second thing that flies is going to um, be from ESA and so that the European Space Agency so there's a lot of different people and players involved. It's going to be a complex system of systems. There's going to be systems on board that are distributed across these different modules that come up in different times. And our overall control of the vehicle has to accommodate that. The second big point is that as we are up there, we're going to generate more data than we have the ability to send back to Earth. We just won't have the calm downlink bandwidth to really get everything that's going on back down. And so there needs to be something smart that tells us exactly what should be coming back to Earth. And finally, critical functions on board the gateway or any of these these space stations are going to have a short time to affect the graph there is kind of a made-up rendition of what would happen if a micrometeoroid struck the gateway the pressure hall of the gateway and that you would hear something you would sense something from your gate your guidance navigation and control standpoint your thrusters might start firing and then you'll also start seeing a pressure loss or at least a pressure feed from your your oxygen and nitrogen tanks so this is something that would happen too quickly for the ground to necessarily get involved in, we would need to have something on board to handle that, especially as we're thinking about going to Mars when we have physics in the way of us being able to communicate any faster than light. So autonomous control really is needed vehicle-wide to handle both nominal and off-nominal operations. So where are we on this? Um, we did a study back in 2017 to think about, okay, based on what we're doing with the ISS right now and where we think we need to be for a Mars reference mission, 
what's what's where are we where's what's going on um, we found some very interesting things one uh, integrated system status and fault response and planning is very important it's really important to think about it from a, a holistic standpoint right now we currently rely very heavily on ground control to to do that overall thinking about um, the vehicle Contingency management across many subsystems is necessary. First, there are emergencies um, that happen like fires or leaks that we're thinking about the system as a whole, you know, avionics and the life support and thrusters and everything kind of gets involved in that. And so coordinating those responses is important. Finally, data management and situational awareness, being able to provide the right data to the crew or ground controllers when you when you need it to be able to understand what's going on in the vehicle is an art. It's, um, well, I guess we can make it into a science, but we are trying to figure out how do we encode that and uh, allow that to be something that we can do on board. And so right now the crew provides some of the sensing, um, all of the sensor data is delivered to the ground and then ground controllers, either using their own smarts or with software that is on their ground console machines, synthesize that data to give it the data analysis and the situational awareness that's needed. So we came up with some ideas then on how we would achieve this autonomy. How did we, we how would we close these gaps? Um, system design obviously plays a really major role. We'll come back to this a little bit more. And um, we really want to make sure that we're defining things to be as inter, uh, to understand the interdependencies as much as possible in the very beginning and to try to separate things as much as we can. But where we got to was that you know having a piece of software a control system on board that did that vehicle systems management was important we've came to the, the point that a distributed hierarchical architecture was very uh, necessary um, based on things in industry um, as well as academia and then also the, the fact the fact that we would need to have clear definitions of our interfaces and interdependencies which is just good systems engineering um, is really very important to be able to add autonomy into our overall system. So overall, we saw make the system simple, right? If we can design this appropriately, it's possible that we can get simple enough autonomy software to make things really happen. So how are we gonna, how are we gonna do that? So we came up with um, a set of rules and um, a framework essentially to be able to allow the types of things that we saw in the previous page. It's very much just a systems engineering way to organize your control across these different um, pieces that are coming up to be able to, to get to a, a workable solution. So we, again, went with a distributed hierarchical architecture. What that means is that we have the vehicle system manager at the, at the top that is in control of, of all the things that are on board the vehicle. But then we are trying to push down concerns as much as we can. Essentially, the each module that comes up, each element of our of our gateway needs to have its own module system manager. And that needs to handle everything that it can that is contained solely to that module. So there are plenty of things that will go across. For example, power is a very important one. It streams from one element at one end of the gateway through all of the elements of the gateway. However, in, when we have hashes closed, um, the life support systems are very much independent uh, across the different modules. And in those standpoints, those modules themselves need to deal with it. And so we've broken it down kind of from that standpoint that you distribute the autonomy as much as possible, but have very clear definitions of how information flows up and commands flow down to be able to manage the different types of things that are going on. We call this the Autonomous Spacecraft Management Architecture, or ASMA. The framework we built based on the ASMA is the Modular Autonomous Systems Technology Framework. It can be used, essentially it's a, as a way to define um, an element of that distributed hierarchical network that can be used kind of across different classes of autonomous systems, standardizes the information sharing and interfaces between the technologies, and is also designed around formal verification and validation principles. One of the biggest problems that we've seen from a standpoint of being able to do autonomy, particularly for such a, a safety critical um, environment such as human spaceflight is that you really need to be thinking from the very beginning on how you're going to verify it. Things like um, uh, 
machine learning and, and those sorts of model-based controls that may adapt and change um, are non-deterministic and in situ, that is something that is, is very difficult to bound and very difficult to verify to then deploy in a safety critical system. Um, so we thought about that and are trying to respect the ability to use those types of technologies, but yet controlling for our system. And so we're using um, assume guarantee contracts that can be formally specified and then model checked to ensure and guard against anything, any behaviors that may be outside of the specifications that we have dictated for it. And MAST, this framework um, enables that. So the Gateway Vehicle Systems Manager um, is the project that I'm um, in charge of right now. We are designing this from the uh, level of requirements and interfaces. Um, we are picking the different technologies that will be used and the different various functions that the Vehicle Systems Manager will um, be in control of. And we are actually providing this as government furnished equipment, which means that there's a group of flight software folks that um, are here at NASA that are developing this and will be deploying this to the Gateway. So it's a very exciting project and, and um, prospect for us to, to put this on board the Gateway. It is designed around this distributed hierarchical autonomous control concept. Um, again, we talked about it in the last uh, couple last slides is that uh, domain of control really is meant to stay as low as possible, but as soon as information is needed from outside of that entity, uh, control moves up to the next level. And so VSM is meant to only look at things that happen vehicle-wide. And in fact, we've been able to assess things like faults and failures, um, and it's about 90% of the faults and failures are, are happening at a level below what VSM really needs to to know about. Um, only that last 10% is something that actually ekes up to the vehicle level, which is reasonable, right? So then you can write software for that 10%, um, while the other 90% of things that are happening are happening lower down in software. It makes it for a much more manageable type of um, architecture and control system to, to build. And so we allow this to happen using data abstraction. Um, and we're trying to do uh, essentially as data driven of an architecture as possible to, to uh, achieve this. The four main functions that BSM um, is, is in charge of, uh, that's not including the fact that uh, if we kind of go back to the other side, the human operators are interfacing directly with the VSM and not directly with any other part of the vehicle. So the human interaction is obviously one of them. But the other main functions that we have um, are as follows. So mission time, mission management and timeline execution is a big one. This one actually takes on uh, and says, what is it that the VSM or what the gateway needs to do from that vehicle level. We put tasks on a timeline. The VSM is um, going to be responsible for scheduling those from um, goals that are given to it by human operators. Um, so if we're not looking at the vehicle for most of the week, we're hoping to only look at it for about eight hours a week from a ground control perspective. The ground controllers can kind of give it its week's goals and this mission management timeline execution function can then move on from there and, and, and schedule the right things to happen at the right time. Times. Spacecraft are very resource limited environments, and so resources uh, need to be managed, optimized, and allocated across the vehicle, particularly when we're trying to plan different activities um, or if we are recovering from, from faults or failures that somehow reduce our, our overall optimal resource load. Fault management is an obvious one. Um, like I said, there are certain faults that have to be handled up at the vehicle level. There's not a, there's not many of them, which is nice, um, but the overall coordinated response to faults that are happening across modules that have impacts across modules does originate from the VSM. And finally, we have systems that are distributed across the various modules. For example, uh, if hatches are open, life support will be happening in any of our habitable modules, um, or power is another good one where it goes across the entire vehicle. Thermal is another one you can't, if things are attached, thermal effects will affect other, other things. And so there is some amount of just basic 
vehicle control and operations that has to happen from a perspective of the vehicle itself and to close those control loops at that level. We don't have many of them. Most of them we can kind of distribute down, um, but for some, uh, we do have to do that at that point. There are also levels of how automated or not automated each of these functions could be from a VSM perspective. If there are humans actively looking at the vehicle and, and doing things, you don't have to have a timeline that has tasks on it. The, the ground could be sending up all the commands and, and having that happen um, manually, if you will. Um, all of the, the different things could be done um, from a a perspective of less automated, more, more human involvement. Um, but obviously we want to be able to get to fully automated to be able to prove out the concepts for our Martian exploration mission. All right, so at this point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change um, attacks a little bit and talk a bit more about uh, system design. And in particular, one of the things that we came up with from autonomy perspective is that robotics are very important to be able to maintain the autonomy of spacecraft, particularly when this spacecraft won't be crewed at all times. We spend a lot of time, our, our crew members spend a, a decent amount of their time maintaining, going around, looking at things, uh, reporting back down to, to the ground, um, doing uh, repair recovery types of actions to to hardware or even just you know cleaning out filters or that sort of thing so those things aren't going to go away when we have a gateway even if we design it to be a little bit less dependent on human maintenance um, it's still going to have opportunities for this and so robotic maintenance and inspection being able to design for that is a really key part of the system design overall We've been working on that for quite a bit um, here at Johnson Space Center. We have a, a very active robotics division and we're focused on human robotics. And so robots that are meant to work in human spaces or with humans themselves in space. Um, Robonaut uh, is a series of robots that is meant to do that. Um, this series of robots is humanoid and it's was designed to be humanoid to be able to use the same sort of tools as humans do to safely share the human's workspace and obviously do real um, work. This is about a nine kilogram weight here that it's um, run, moving around. So this Robonaut 2 program was started in 2007 with General Motors, um, leveraged the technology from the Robonaut 1, which was uh, funded by uh, DARPA, which is an advanced um, technology development uh, part of our defense um, agency in the U.S. And um, Robonaut actually launched um, on one of the last space shuttle flights in February 2011 to go onto the International Space Station to do some work there. The idea then was to be able to understand what kind of maintenance and activities uh, the v that the Robonaut could do on board. So one of the things that uh, using the human's tools and interfaces is important is that when we're sending things on rockets up to a space station, every little bit of mass counts. And so this was really meant to be kind of what do we, how do we interface as cl closely as possible and not have any extra tools sent up. So um, this is one of the demonstrations that we did on board. It's a task board. Uh, we had a task board in front of it, so you can kind of see uh, behind it. And this is um, a soft goods panel. And so the soft goods with these little grommets are actually pretty common outside the International Space Station. We put blankets over things to protect for from space dust and also thermal effects. Um, and so this is a demonstration of how Robonaut is pulling back um, a, a blanket and, and then returning it. Um, the stuff that you're not seeing, I mean, this is pretty cool. Um, we actually had a decent amount of autonomy that was built in on the vision and whether it decided to do, you know, go this way or that way and how it decided where it stuck its finger um, initially and, and that sort of thing. But uh, it still involved a team of like five or six people um, watching the robot on the ground, commanding it, pointing, clicking. And this small little task took us um, several hours to do. It was a, a complete, it was a success in that it got it done, but it was a complete failure in the standpoint of how long it took to do a very simple task and how much human involvement was necessary. So we decided to think about this a little differently. Um, and what we did is, is 
we used this um, concept that was first uh, developed by actually several different groups uh, in the robotics, DARPA Robotics Challenge. And so this uh, challenge allowed um, people to kind of think about supervisory control in a more autonomous sense. And so we moved more in that direction. What is an affordance template? So an affordance is basically defined as an something that the object gives you, something it affords you for manipulation. And so various objects may have different ways that you could grasp or hold or, or activate or manipulate it. Um, and so those objects would have several affordances. In templates, we have basically taken those affordances for different modeled objects and templatized them to allow different robots to be able to handle them. And so you can see some pictures here of how it, it puts together kind of the robot, the sensor information from the robot, planning mechanisms, you see kind of purple there that that, that shows how the, the robot's going to move. Um, and then also human interaction standpoints where you can point and click and, and, and just tell the robot what to do. So this is a, definitely a step in the right direction. And so um, about six years ago, we did this demonstration here where Robonaut um, was meant to, uh, now you see has creepy legs and they're just manipulators that are grasping onto these handrails um, that humans use to move around in the International Space Station. And it was uh, meant to kind of show uh, how Robonaut could climb across. Um, and so we are, um, there's a couple key things to show. So it's it's climbing across our our, our um, medium fidelity mock-up of the ISS. Um, it's in a, a zero gravity environment. Uh, it's a gravity offload um, robot that's holding onto it above. And then you see the same um, interfaces here that we had before. Um, I think there's there's one extra. There's this RFID reader, but then you see the soft goods panel. And this right here where you saw those three people looking at the computer screen is one of the biggest parts of this. So this overall thing, overall from starting to climbing across to now doing this the soft goods manipulation was about 30 minutes long. We had three people instead of six um, and the, the mood is less intense. I'll, I'll just, you'll have to believe me on that um, having been at both of these, uh, these events. Uh, they're definitely controlling and involved in what the robot is doing, but uh, they're, they're not as intense into what was going on and it retrieves an, an object from there and um, we can kind of go along our way. So this was a really big success. It definitely shrunk down the time, allowed us to be a little bit less involved in what the robot was doing and, and did a, a more complex task than we did on, on board. That drove us to looking at this general um, purpose algorithm design and execution framework called Task Force that allowed us to now start stringing together the different types of actions and manipulations that the robot needed to do. So as you saw, there was four or five affordances in the previous example. Each one of those was individually commanded by the folks that were um, on console, if you will. And that this task force was meant to allow us to now string those together so that we didn't have to command each and everything. Now we can talk about activities in a little bit higher standpoint. And so this video um, is from, I think, 2017. I um, mean, it is a, um, a demonstration of the robot opening a hatch and then getting into a logistics module and it retrieving a logistics bag. You kind of see the white um, bag that's buckled in a little bit beyond where the robot is. Our robot is in Argos again, this uh, gravity offload facility, um, and is doing some very interesting manipulation and moving in constrained motion. And so the constrained motion planning where it just kind of wiggles down and then it's going to grab and do a radial motion with its hand and then move um, the hatch on the rail then as well is, is really impressive. Um, but the really most impressive thing that I think about this is if you look over in the, the left kind of corner, there's a guy in black that he's looking at some computer screens. Um, he's, he's my operator. You'll see him as if you kind of watch him in different places. Um, he'll watch, he'll scratch his back, he'll drink some coffee, he'll pick his nose. He's not all in on the control of this robot. He's watching, he's definitely observing, supervising, if you will, but he is not constantly telling the robot what to do. In general, the robot is doing things 
based on its plan and based on its sensory input autonomously. Um, the two reasons I like this, this demonstration the most are, are the one where it is uh, the operator is, is mostly hands off. And in fact, when we get to this point and grabbing this bag, which was not fully placed, you can kind of see on the floor there that that overall structure is just kind of set there. The bag itself is cloth with a white handle that's cloth. And then the, the seat belt is also um, not, not rigid. And so all of these flexible materials are, they're never in the same place twice. And then having the robot climb across, you know, the different um, handrails that it does, we're never quite hitting at the same place each time. But still, we had about a 90% success rate of the, the robot grasping this bag, pulling it out without any operator input in, at all on it. So it was very quite impressive. And it kind of just looks like it's it should be able to do it. It's it's kind of um, smooth and ready. And so this was a really big, important um, step in our, 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 our path to try to get to um, autonomous robotic logistics control. Sorry, let me go back here. So finally, um, the manipulation framework, we, we decided to pull in kind of everything, including some object classification and localization. We have our planning tools, affordance templates, task force. We pull these all together um, and we've been able to really do some really uh, autonomous and nice things with them. This is um, not the last one that we did, but it, it is one of the, the last uh, demonstrations we did kind of in this frame. Um, but it involves now two robots. The um, Astrobe stand-in here is floating around with some RFID, RFID sensors um, to decide which one of these um, cool IKEA shelves that uh, are standing in for drawers on the ISS uh, a bag is in that has some some object that the operators need retrieved. Um, so. The uh, turtle bot or Astro Bean goes around, decides which one it is. It can move quite a bit faster than Robonaut can. Um, and then Robonaut climbs over to do it and uh, goes and, and retrieves the bag. Again, all of this is done with um, just one operator and again, as autonomously as possible. In fact, right here, you'll see that the robot uh, failed to grasp the handrail and backed up and then regressed. That was completely autonomous, no operator interaction that was needed for that. And then positions the torso for grabbing. We went on from here to uh, make this more realistic. We, we had a, a robot on the, on the International Space Station we wanted to, to use this on. Um, and so we went on to basically say, okay, right now we do all of our planning on the ground and we're sending, you know, um, megabits per second back and forth. We needed to move that down to kilobits per second. As we kind of talked about, there's more data than bandwidth. Um, and so making, even for the ISS, making our bandwidth as, as low as possible as we were commanding back and forth is very important. Um, and so we did that. We also, if you can see, the, the ground is very pristine. Um, there's no clutter. Uh, we added quite a bit of clutter to be much more like what the International Space Station has and, and did the same demonstration with that. And so to kind of tie this all together, the manipulation, um, mobility, and sensing that you get with Robonaut uh, is, and with any robot really, is kind of a, a subset of the overall autonomy that's needed for our autonomous vehicle. Um, and so from a, a standpoint of gateway and having distributed health management, task planning, data management, there's quite a few um, things that fall under those buckets that really are are aided uh, and maybe are, aren't even possible until you get a robot on board. And so, you know, using the, the Robonaut as somewhat of a microcosm for overall what's going on um, on a, an autonomous vehicle has been something that has uh, produced, I think, a lot of fruitful research and work that's helped us in now deciding kind of from the vehicle system manager standpoint, what types of technologies to use and to, to go forward. So what's, what's next? Um, we are working right now to launch Gateway in late 2024. Um, it will take about a year to get out to lunar orbit. Uh, it will have a, an active vehicle systems manager on board. And so we're, we're um, rapidly coming up on, you know, getting to, uh, 
where we have our, our critical design review and those sorts of things for VSM. As we move to assembly complete, so we're planning on adding several elements to uh, the gateway in the coming, the years after that. So 2025, if, I think is, is the next one that's coming up from, from the European Space Agency, logistics modules, um, refueling um, possibilities and airlock, lots of things that will be on board gateway to, uh, to enable science and then also the sustaining missions to the, the Martians or to the lunar surface. But thinking Martian, we are expecting to demonstrate a full 21 day autonomy of Gateway where we are not going to have ground operators involved at all in what the Gateway does for three full weeks. And this is because of the superior conjunction between um, the Mar or Mars and the Earth, basically when the sun's right in between them, we won't be able to talk to anything on Mars for, for three weeks. And so this is a, a big demonstration to kind of show this Mars forward approach of, of how we're doing this and, and what we might be able to do. We also have um, a, a lot of kind of lower level research. So this is high technology readiness level stuff. We're looking forward to, to Martian and other types of habitats, smart habitats um, through university research. We have two institutes, um, one led by Purdue and the other one led by University of California Davis um, that are looking at kind of what are all of the different pieces of technology that we will need for, for Mars, taking what we've got now and moving them beyond. And so those are very exciting pieces of work. And then finally, ISS as a test bed, Astrobe and Robonaut um, work continues even now. Um, Astrobe is very active on board the ISS and it's um, planning to, to kind of prove out the addition of these robots into our autonomy architecture in the coming years. I think that is all I have. Um, are there any questions? Okay, so you can you can either raise your hand to uh, to ask a question or or send a question via the chat, and then we will give you uh, uh, the possibility in an orderly fashion to to ask ask the question. Now there are some questions. If not, if not yet, I will start with one uh, simple question. Uh, it's impressive what, what what you're doing with with the robots. I uh, one of the things that uh, I had in mind is how how do you deal with with uh, with the large time delays that you get uh, for commands from from ground control to the to to the station, which will be many many kilometers or miles away from from Earth. Yeah, that's a great question. So from a robotic standpoint, there's a, a method of control that's can, that's called teleoperation. Um, it's just not possible. It's not even really possible from the Earth to the ISS, which has very short time delays, like a second or less. Um, it just gets very difficult to, to kind of accommodate that. Um, and so we really are focusing for both robots and for the, the VSM is bringing the level of commands up so instead of saying move an inch right you say move to this point and so that move to this point you can get then it has to sit there and figure out the plan and whatever else so it's, it's a higher level command it's a something that you can go and do and it maybe it takes 20 minutes to do but you you aren't expecting to have that loop closed essentially in any short amount of time you just have that that longer that lower bandwidth control loop if you will Hey, thank you. Have question. another question. Uh, yeah. I... Thank you, Julia, for your very nice presentation. And uh, uh, what about uh, fault detection? I mean, uh, I, I imagine that uh, you have many possible faults in 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 a, in, a, in a exploration. Uh, but uh, how do you uh, how do you make this uh, pronostic of faults? I mean, I I. I I understand that you, you don't wait to the fault. You can uh, make pronostics or something like that. 
Yeah, so there's a very active set of um, research that we've been funding for a very long time in, in a small business initiative um, to kind of push that forward. And it comes down to a really nice way of encoding inference trees. And so we build um, fault trees, so types of uh, basically information that we think we can be getting and what that means. Um, and so we, we build that from um, design um, and, and we can make it, add on to it kind of as we get uh, more more things but the the tool that allows allows you to kind of do a model based system over what what's all going on and then it has the ability to reason over that quickly based on um, things that are getting back it can be you know different bayesian types of you know inference uh, uh, agents or you can just have logical gates or you can put in kind of whatever you want based on the model of your system um, but it, it allows you to kind of have that framework that essentially does the the, the plumbing it does the the wiring up between all of these different things and then gives you back kind of uh, a set of things that are most likely to be the cause of that and then you might have to set basically loops around that where you reduce um, the the uncertainty that you might have in in the types of things that might have happened um, and so we've we've built that in kind of from a standpoint is we're using some some work uh, it's called the, the teams RT it's it's a, a company that has been an SBIR um, funded company for for several uh, years from uh, the NASA standpoint so we're using their technology um, it was developed uh, we've actually used it on the, the space launch system as well and we've been using it from our Orion standpoint to kind of understand it and so we're pulling that in um, and then we're tying that loop around that kind of with uh, our timeline management to say okay well if we get stuck and we have three options and we have to decide how to deal with it, then we need to do isolation actions and that sort of thing. So it, it's, it's a pretty complex problem. And I think that's where we spend a lot of time. We have a whole team full of people that are building the model and the document that goes with the model so everybody can look. And, and then yeah. each one of the modules themselves are building their own model at a different level, you know, and so you've got kind of the pieces of these models pulling together. and. Um, and so it's, it's exciting to see it. And I think at the end of the day, each each part of the vehicle will have its own piece of the model and then it'll kind of have to come together at the VSM level. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are many uh, knowledge about the past and we can do in the future, I, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and uh, what about uh, the lack of gravity uh, for the robot? I mean, uh, you observe a difference in the in the robot uh, performance in in ground and in the space space uh, station. There's and so many differences. It's crazy. Like it's things that you don't even think about, right? Um, for one, we we use an inverse dynamics um, uh, algorithm to kind of make sure that we're putting the right amount of force out there. It's it's as um, a series elastic controlled robot so it's got the joints where you're you're doing force control essentially for it um, and so we feed forward the inverse dynamics um, when you don't have gravity that's a whole different uh, solution and so when you stick it the robot weighs a lot three um, to about 300 kilograms or so that the full robot does and so it can't hold itself up in gravity it just wouldn't be able to do that so we stick it in this gravity offload facility where it attaches at kind of the the hips if you will if you um, make it anthropomorphic um but the legs then aren't they're still in gravity right so it's lifting up the overall robot but the legs are still in gravity so you have to kind of do these these fun things where the legs are still kind of compensating for their own gravity, but they're not compensating for the full robot's gravity. And, you know, then on board, you don't have to worry about any of that, but you also have this regenerative cu current that comes when you basically, if you let your legs go down, the potential energy of it going down in a gravity field generates electricity that goes back up through your motors and, you know, through your whole system. And so if you're plugged into a wall versus a battery that matters, but on orbit, it doesn't. 
happen. You don't have potential energy, right? And so you you have to really think about the design of your robot to make sure that it's going to work no matter whether you're in gravity or not, because you have to test it in gravity yeah. somehow, right? <laughs> and so there's a, there's a quite a bit of differences um, from that. But then then you get into sensors and the, the cameras, and if you saw through the eyes and then one video, there's all those pixels that are dead, like green and red. Yeah, that happens immediately, you know, and then it just kind of progressively gets worse. And so then your then your whole sensors are different than what you had on the ground. And you can't go and touch your robot, which is hard <laughs> to do anything with, you know. So there's it's a lot of um, it's a lot of challenges. Yeah. Yeah. I imagine. And, and I imagine uh, this lack of uh, the gravity is modeled as a disturbance. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, okay. it's you have yeah. to deal with it. <laughs> We, we, we have another question from uh, Marcos Angel Gonzalez. Maybe maybe you can pose a question, Marcos. Or, or, yes, or, I, I'm okay. not in my computer, so can you can you read, please? Because okay. it's difficult for me. Okay, I, I will read. I will read the question then. It's uh, I, the question says I will make this question with absolute envy of the work they are doing. <laughs> it is impressive. How do you deal with all the different areas that have to interact in order to obtain the robot control and automation from a human resources point of view, as well as theoretical, the combination of vision, electronics, mechanics, et cetera? Yeah, so we have a pretty big team. Uh, it's kind of how it ends up. So we're uh, the lab that was working with Robonaut, uh, we had about 15 people full time and then um, students, uh, NASA, is great at finding um, young people who want to work there, <laughs> at least for you know co-ops and internships. And so we we would do a lot of that and a lot of work with with universities. There's actually a lot of mechanisms for us to be able to bring in um, students and professors uh, around the United States, at least to 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 help work out. And so we did um, a lot of that. Um, so for example, Rice University, who we were very closely affiliated with, and I, I was an adjunct for a little while. Um, at the, they, there's a, a lab there. There's a couple labs there that we work with a lot. But one of them is Lydia Kravaki's group, and she does robotic path planning. And so we didn't really have anybody who did path planning so much. We just used her students um, to do all of the, the work that you saw that constrained motion planning um, was all uh, PhD students who got to see their stuff in space, basically. So they uh, they, they really enjoyed that. Um, from a gateway perspective, I mean, there's hundreds of people all over that we're interacting with at all times. It's a huge project management and systems engineering feat that takes more than me, for sure, to, uh, to make go. Great. Are there any 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 more Thanks questions so from the audience? Or Marcos, do you want to say something else? I don't know. Just I, I, I think so lot. I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question. Yes. Uh, uh, Go ahead. How, how, how about the control algorithms with many constraints and the, is, and I think it's very complex, but the, when the, to have a good trade-off with precision and reject of uncertainties and interact with the ambience and precision and so on, how about the control algorithms? How it is the complexity and so on? Yeah, um, complexity is a very interesting question. So from a Romanet perspective, uh, we, we made the robot a lot more capable than it needs to be. It has something like 58 degrees of freedom. Um, obviously, there, there are many constraints, um, both from a standpoint of the, the place it's in and then like where it can actually um, go and grasp and how fast it can go. I mean, there's a safety issue if it goes too fast. And so we have to constrain that. Um, and so the constrained motion planning um, is one of the, the biggest things that we, uh, I think, achieved from a standpoint of being able to do that. Because when we first started a um, long time ago, and we've gone through several students who kind of helped us improve um, we really weren't able to find good solutions um, that weren't didn't look crazy because you can't have your your robot kind of like doing flips and stuff in the ISS I mean they people would stop that probably <laughs> so it also had the constraint of management had to look at it and say no I think that's safe I think that's reasonable right and so there was even kind of those types of constraints um, and so 
managing those constraints was was the biggest um, I think advance that we had is we figured out a good way to specify and then manage those constraints, turn them on and off, um, list them, have basically feedback given to the human operator on which constraints were possible or, or breaking your overall system um, and those sorts of things. And so this constrained motion planning um, algorithm that uh, was developed by um, Zach Kingston, who just graduated from Rice actually, uh, is is the 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 young man's name, but um, has really helped us from a constraint standpoint of vision because that was also a, a really important part. Um, we ended up using um, AR markers or QR codes essentially, um, April tags, uh, to al allow us to identify things more quickly. So not everything was uh, could get an April tag, but you saw probably in the videos, there was quite a few of those. And that was something that we didn't, we didn't do for everything, but kind of as we were getting into these more constrained uh, environments that we were focusing on something else, we would, we would kind of um, cheat, if you will, uh, or use the design of the overall environment in, in our favor to, uh, to help things get a little bit less complex. And so that was another way to do do it. And in fact, if we were thinking about Gateway, because it's a brand new vehicle, um, and thinking from a, a, a control standpoint of, if I want to put a robot in there, how can I make it as simple as possible for the robot? Um, there's a lot of things you can do. And I, I have my famous example is, is a doorknob, right? Um, in my old house, we had these doorknobs that were, were round, they're the circular doorknobs. Um, they're fine for humans, but they're they're hard for robots. If you instead had a, a doorknob that's a lever, uh, that's a that's a robot friendly. My new house has has lever ones, right? So those are robot friendly doorknobs. And so you can make small decisions like that that can really reduce the complexity overall of your robot, your control system, and, and decrease essentially the constraints on your system. Great. Is there another questions? If not, I can I can pose one. <laughs> Just. Uh, uh, I was wondering uh, whether making it humanoid was too much of a challenge, maybe. I mean, why not? Uh, were there some times when you said, OK, we might have been doing this better if this was, was not a humanoid? Or if you have thought about, I mean, because even if it's humanoid, you can make it super humanoid, like having eyes on the back or, 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 or things vision or other sensors that humans don't have at certain places. So uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, so the reason that we picked humanoid at first was to, to be a bit, a bit more um, in, compatible with the interfaces. And so we really were, when we first built this, we were thinking outside um, the extravehicular activity. So people in spacesuits were what we were competing against, which actually, I think we we have better dexterity from our robot hand than a spacesuited astronaut would, just because of the pressure differences they have to do with their fingers and just the grasp and grasp everything that they would have to do. Um, but from an inside perspective, you're right, uh, we really went a little overkill for something that wouldn't need that. And so um, we've thought actually quite a bit uh, on what is the optimal end effector design? What would we do for an inside robot? Um, what does it look like? Um, it doesn't need to have, um, it doesn't need to be humanoid. And in fact, the hands probably wouldn't be humanoid. A, a two finger gripper is probably enough for most of the things we want to do, as long as you articulate the joints uh, kind of in a, in a certain way. Um, but from a standpoint of how many arms would you have, you, you probably would want four. Um, and then you might want an extra thing for your, your sensors. Um, and so like even our robot, Robonaut, its legs aren't really legs. Like they're just manipulators. They have cameras in the bottom. Um, and so they are a bit more like the superhuman that you might um, expect uh, for that. But uh, it's definitely a question. And I think that, um, we learned a lot from having a humanoid and knowing kind of what we could back off on. Great. Um, mm -hmm. We're coming to the end of the talk. Maybe we have time for just one quick extra question. Justin, uh, just a, a small question for the students here. What kind of, of uh, uh, control strategies do you implement in, in the... What kind of, I'm sorry? What, what kind of, of um, control strategies do you implement in, in, the, in the space center, in the robots, in the, all the things you, you design? 
Oh man, I, well, overall, I mean, probably many of them. So there's there's a lot of things that um, there's several groups that do controls. Um, obviously, ours with robots and automation, we're looking at controls from the very lowest levels all the way up. You know, like on our our joints for our robot. Um, you know, there's the typical control loops that you would see with PID controllers and feed forward and, and that sort of thing. Um, as you get a little higher up, you think a little bit more about hybrid control. I, I, I like hybrid control the best, as you might can kind of tell with the distributed hierarchical type of things that can be a little bit more like along that. Um, robust control, we've, we've tried some stuff doing a kind of more of the robust control, the H-Infinity types of things um, with our rovers. Uh, they tend to have a little bit more um, they use for that. So they'll, they'll we'll have a non-holonomic um, rovers that can do those sorts of things so you can have that but then on the other side you have guidance navigation and control which are the things that control your spacecraft and how we go in orbit and you know maintaining your attitude and um, getting out to the, the moon and that sort of thing and they have a whole other set of of things the receding horizon is a very useful one that they have and uh, so there's there's a lot of different i i would pay attention in my controls classes if if I were you, that's, I guess, my, my advice is <laughs> these different strategies, they come into play in different places all over. Yeah, I imagine, of course, of course. Yeah. Okay. Great. So we're coming to the end of this uh, plenary talk. And uh, we would like to thank again, uh, 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 Julia Badger, Professor Badger, for, 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 for kindly agreeing to give this talk. And uh, I, I uh, just... Uh, small <laughs> thank you we will we'll, uh, send you some 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 uh, uh, certificate of participation in the, in the future but um, just uh, the message to all the students that are present here just attend your control classes and see that this is applied uh, at at many levels and now that space exploration is is, is, is more an international thing I would say uh, there's opportunity for for, for many of of us from other countries to to get into this also. So, thank you again, Julia, for 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 being here, and uh, and we thank the audience for 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 this. I don't know if there's another uh, message from the organizers. No, uh, no, we will continue with the schedule uh, for the next two uh, sessions: estimation and optimal control, and uh, electro electromechanical system. Uh, potential systems, okay? So, thank you, thank you again. Thank you very much. We'll see you in, in 10 minutes in the, in the sessions. Bye, thank you. Let's give an applause. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>